Hello once again, everybody, and thank you for joining me in the Betters Box. This is ATS.io's MLB betting podcast for Thursday, June 3rd. I'm your host, Adam Burke. Make sure you download the ATS app, which you can find in the Google Play Store or in the Apple Store. It's a bet tracker, an odd screen, a stats database, full article integration from the website, lots of helpful handicapping tools and resources in that ATS app. So make sure you check that out. It's also the place to find daily tracking for my MLB Picks and Tips article, which you can find every day over at ATS.io. Comprehensive, detailed breakdowns on the games, on the card. You can find that over at the website on a daily basis. Also covering golf, NASCAR, UFC, and a variety of other things over there at the website. So make sure you check that out. And check out what our other writers are doing across the NBA, NHL, WNBA, and all of the other sports that are going on as well. With that, today's format, Beyond the Box Score, Down the Lines, a pick for tonight's action, and then a preview of the weekend ahead. Lots to get to here on today's show, so let's go ahead and dive right in. With a look beyond the box score, and you know something I want to take some time to talk about here today, I've talked a lot about individual pitchers and looking for positive and negative regression with them indicators across things like cluster luck their splits with the bases empty and with runners in scoring position with Babbitt batting average on balls in play with left on base percentage with some of those ERA and FIP discrepancies so we talked a lot about individual pitchers as this season has gone along but what about teams what about taking a look at kind of a larger scale at team regression that is likely to happen kind of looking at the anatomy of an underachieving or overachieving team, kind of explaining the reasons why some of these things are taking place here. So let's start by taking a look at some overachievers around Major League Baseball based on a variety of indicators, some of the alternate standings metrics based on kind of my thoughts, my thought process, and all of that. So we take a look here first, and I'm doing these just in alphabetical order just to make it easy. We look first at the Boston Red Sox. Now, they're only plus two games in base runs. They're exactly where they should be by Pythagorean win-loss and then plus 3.7 in third-order win percentage. Now, base runs, a context-neutral standings metric. So it takes all of the individual outcomes that have happened on the hitting side and on the pitching side, throws them all together, spits out expected runs scored per game, expected runs allowed per game, and then uses Pythagorean win-loss to come up with a record. So Boston here has overachieved by two games based on what base runs is saying here. They're exactly where they should be by Pythagorean win loss, but they are plus 3.7 in third order win percentage. So basically what we're looking at here with the Boston Red Sox is exactly what I've been talking about. Exactly what I talked about as we went into this series against the Houston Astros as well, where They've played a pretty weak schedule to this point in time. So they've been able to look a little bit better than they probably are. And third order win percentage is an alternate standings metric that looks at underlying statistics and performance and all of that, but also looks at it in the context of quality of opponents. So that's why Boston overachieving by 3.7 games, according to their third order win percentage, and they are 32 and 23 here on the season based on their actual results, but overachieving by about four games, according to third order win percentage. So when you look at what's happened in this series against Houston, you can kind of see why they've been outscored 18 to four in the first three games of this series. I do like Boston today for what it's worth, but they've been outscored by 14 runs over these three games. Houston has won all three of them. And when you look at the Red Sox here this season, They've not yet played New York. They've not yet played the Yankees. They will do that this weekend at Yankee Stadium. And they've only played three games against Tampa Bay. And Tampa Bay, a team that they swept all the way back in the first week of the season. They played some games against Toronto. They've maybe run into some better teams across the league, stuff like that. But the biggest thing for Boston was that their quality of competition was not very high. So that's why they've been considered an overachiever in the third order win percentage department And why what's happened here this week, probably not that big of a surprise. However, what I will say is I don't think that Boston is a bad team. I think Boston is a pretty decent team. 
And I love what they're doing on the pitching side in terms of going all in with home run prevention. But something that's really important to think about, and this is why I look at the larger sample size over anything else, is that in this series alone, in these three games where the Red Sox have only scored four runs, their road WOBA, weighted on base average, has gone down 19 points because of these three games. So I don't think that's necessarily a long-lasting indicator. I think their offense is built to hit both on the road and at home. They're not overly power dependent. They make a lot of contact. They don't walk a lot on the road. So that's part of the problem here with their Woba dropping so quickly. But again, the biggest thing here for Boston is that they've run into a better caliber of opponent. And so I think as we go forward here, much like what I kind of talked about with the San Diego Padres, who've kind of hit the skids a little bit here, facing some better opponents like Houston, like the Cubs, this is what you kind of look for with some of these teams. If they're overachieving a little bit by third order win percentage, which you can find over at claydavenport.com, that's because they haven't played a lot of really good teams. So that's part of the equation here for the Boston Red Sox. Another team that's overachieving, in my opinion, is the Chicago Cubs. Now, the Cubs are plus three in base runs. When you look at them on the season here, they're a 32 and 23 team, which is exactly what their Pythagorean win loss suggests. But by base runs, they're a 29 and 26 team. They're plus 4.2 wins in third order win percentage. So let's talk about the reasons why this Cubs team is overachieving. First, massive home road splits. They're 21 and 10 at home with a plus 51 run differential. They're 11 and 13 on the road with a minus 13 run differential. Now, I think part of this has to do with the fact that Wrigley Field has gone full Wrigley this season. We've seen a lot of games with a lot of wind, a lot of precipitation, a lot of just difficult games to want to go out there and play. And I think that has had a negative impact on the visiting teams especially those that haven't been there in a while. Like, for example, how the Cubs are 9-0 and at home against the Padres, the Dodgers, and the Mets. I would not expect them to have that same measure of success when they go on the road and play against those teams. But ultimately, rather than just some sort of narrative idea that I have about Wrigley Field, there's a lot going on with this team from a base run standpoint that is worth mentioning. Now, on the season... The Cubs have scored 4.64 runs per game. According to base runs, if you take sequencing completely out of the equation, 4.65 runs per game. So they are exactly where they are supposed to be offensively according to base runs. However, the Cubs have allowed 3.95 runs per game. And according to base runs, they should be allowing 4.46 runs per game. So here's the reason why we have such a big gap here for the Chicago Cubs. First of all, their rotation is 30th in F4 and 29th in FIP. Their starting pitching has been abominable this season for the Chicago Cubs. However, their bullpen, top five in both FIP and ERA. They have an 80.1% left on base percentage as a team here so far this season. That's the fourth highest in baseball. So the Cubs have gotten very fortunate in a lot of important high leverage situations. They've allowed a 312 weighted on base average with the bases empty, that ranks 20th. But with men in scoring position, they rank 4th with a 277 weighted on base average. This is where sequencing matters so much. The Cubs are basically doing pretty well offensively with men in scoring position and then doing very well on the pitching side with men in scoring position. Generally speaking, that will level off. Usually you will see regression to the mean in that department. So that 80.1% left on base percentage as a team is very much something that I would expect to see drop as we go forward here with this Cubs team. So the thing that you really want to pay attention to here for them specifically is that this comes from the bullpen. They have a 77.8% left on base percentage as a full pitching staff and an 80.1% left on base percentage from the bullpen. So when you look at this bullpen, I think this is a unit that cannot sustain this kind of pace. 
as the Cubs play better teams, as the Cubs get into situations where that bullpen regresses, I think their record as a whole will wind up coming back to the pack. So the Cubs are very much a negative regression team for me against good competition. And I am fading them here today against the San Francisco Giants with Zach Davies on the mound against Anthony DeSclefani. Another overachiever here, and obviously this one hurts for me, the Cleveland Indians. Uh, look, I mean, this Indians team, they're, 20, they're 30 and 24. They shouldn't be. By base runs, they should be 25 and 29. By Pythagorean win loss, they should be 26 and 28. Third order win percentage, they are overachieving by 4.8 wins on the season here so far. They're a 30 and 24 team but they're minus six in run differential base run says they should be minus 16 where offensively they're actually overachieving a little bit. And then on the defensive side, they're overachieving a little bit as well. Now they're only eight and six in one run games, which I think is very interesting because they've got such a great back end of the bullpen, but all eight of their wins and run one, one run games, excuse me, came in the month of May. So the Indians here, With their bullpen, much like what I just talked about with the Cubs, a left on base percentage over 80%. So that's pretty much it. They're stranding a very, very high percentage of their runners. So they're keeping those guys from scoring and giving this really anemic offense a chance to actually win some games here. On offense, they're 28th in weighted on base average with men in scoring position. They are 5-20 and when they've scored three or fewer runs. They are 25-4. and when they've scored four or more runs. So basically that's the recipe for success for the Indians. If they score four runs, they've got a good chance to win. But also with their bullpen keeping them in games, they've won 10 games where they've been trailing after four innings because teams just aren't scratching out a lot of runs against their bullpen. Now this one's a little bit difficult for me because when you look at contact quality, the Indians have made a lot of quality contact and they've had very little success with those results. So maybe they're not as bad as some of these alternate standings metrics suggest, but they are definitely overachieving to say the least. They've got some injury concerns on the starting pitching side. Now Uh, they've got injury concerns in the lineup as well. This is not a very good baseball team, but it's one that is overachieving here. So I do think as we go forward, there will be some opportunities to fade the Indians. And I do think we will see some line moves against the Indians when guys like Shane Bieber and Aaron Savale are not on the mound. Another overachiever here is the Oakland Athletics. Oakland here plus three in base runs, plus four in Pythagorean win loss, and plus 3.3 in third order win percentage. Now, Oakland 33 and 25 leading that American League West division, but Pythagorean win loss and base runs put them more in that 500 range. Few different things here for Oakland. First of all, they're 17 and 17 at home, but they're minus 28 in run differential. They're 16 and eight on the road, plus 29 in run differential. So they're one of those teams that has those home road splits offensively that you want to pay attention to. They're 11 and seven in one run games. So they've done well in that department. But the thing of it is they started 0 and six this season and were outscored 50 to 13. So right now this is a team that's plus one in run differential but started the season minus 37 over their first six games. So since then, they've actually played very, very well for the most part. Now, when we look at just kind of what's happened with them in the big picture, they started bad and then won 13 games in a row. They had four shutouts in that span. They've got five walk-off wins on the season. They are 10-3 and in games tied after five innings. So what this basically is for Oakland is not a play on or a play against situation or anything like that. It's just the way that things have played out this season where they got off to such a horrific start, won 13 games in a row to get back on track and all of it kind of balancing out, all of it kind of evening out a little bit. Are they overachieving? Yes, to a degree. Is this a team that I want to actively fade? No, not really. So a lot of things to take a look at here with Oakland But even though their alternate standings metrics aren't really as excited about them as their actual record would suggest, I don't think this is a team that we want to rush to fade anytime soon. A team I do think we can fade 
and a team I think we should fade in pretty short order here is the Seattle Mariners. Seattle is 28 and 29 on the season here so far. They are minus 54 in run differential. They've lost by five or more runs on 12 different occasions so far this season. In games decided by five or more runs, which baseball reference terms blowouts, they are minus 68 in run differential in those games. I think there's been 15 of them. This is a team that's second in baseball in weighted on base average with Mars in scoring position. They're first in weighted runs created plus and fourth in batting average. This is not a good offensive team at all, but they've gotten their hits at the most important times. So they've had success with men in scoring position. I don't think that that's going to continue as we go forward here throughout the course of this season. They were 13 and 15 in the month of May, despite being minus 43 in run differential. We know Seattle can't hit at home. That's been well documented here on this show. But as we look at this team, plus four in base runs, plus five in Pythagorean win loss, plus five in third order win percentage, they are a massive overachiever at this point in time. This is not a team that should be anywhere close to a 500 record, but they are. So the Mariners, it's tough to fade them because you're laying a lot of big prices to fade them, but the Mariners are definitely a fade team here. And in fact, we've seen a lot of money coming in against them throughout the week here so far in their games against Oakland and then also tonight against the Los Angeles Angels. So the market has very much picked up on this and is looking to fade Seattle with any chance possible. The last overachiever here is the St. Louis Cardinals, who are plus three in base runs, plus four in Pythagorean win-loss, plus 3.8 in third-order win percentage. They are 31 and 25, but have a minus 10 run differential. So Pythagorean win-loss puts them at 27 and 29. Base runs puts them at 28 and 28. Third-order win percentage kind of in that 27 and 29 range. A few things about the Cardinals here. First, Jack Flaherty on the IL with what has been termed a serious oblique injury. He probably won't be back until August, I would say, at the earliest. So that's one thing. Second thing, St. Louis here, 26-0 and with a lead after five innings. Now, as I've talked about, league average is around 83%, 82 or 83% that you win games with a lead after five innings. St. Louis is 26-0. and That will not continue. I guarantee you they will not finish this season with a perfect record. So the Cardinals have done very well in terms of protecting the leads that they have gotten. They've pitched around a high walk rate. But the biggest thing here is that they have the lowest home run to fly ball percentage in baseball by far. I mean, it's really not even close. So this is a Cardinals team that actually, when you look at them, they've allowed 4.45 runs per game. But according to base runs, they should only be allowing 4.12. So that speaks to the high walk rate and the impact it has had on this team. But it's almost like the game is driven by the long ball. You know, the Cardinals have been able to perform very well because they just don't give up home runs. And they're 26-0 and with a lead after five innings. I think both of those things regress as the summer goes along. So the Cardinals are indeed a fade team to me here as we move forward. I got a set of underachievers for you here as well. And before I do that, I want to remind you that you can get on the list for the betters box notes, the mailing list for the notes I use for the show by emailing me skating tripods at gmail.com. Talk about a lot of analytics, a lot of numbers, a lot of data when I do this show. So it helps to have the notes in front of you, either as you listen back through or as you listen for the first time. So email me skating tripods at gmail.com for the show notes here. And again, the six overachieving teams in my mind, based on either my observations or the alternate standings metrics that are out there, the Red Sox, Cubs, Indians, A's, Mariners, and the Cardinals. Now, as far as some underachievers go, and again, running through these in alphabetical order here, how about the Baltimore Orioles? Not a good team by any means, 19 and 37 here on the season so far. But their minus four in base runs should be more like 23 and 33, minus three in Pythagorean win loss, and then minus 4.2 in third order win percentage. 
Now, this is an Orioles team. It's four and nine in one run games. So that doesn't help. Typically, teams are going to be plus or minus three games in terms of their one run games record. But Baltimore, five and 23 in the month of May. So they just had a horrific, awful month of May, had a big, long losing streak. Uh, they had some periods where the starting rotation was in a major state of flux. The bullpen got kind of burned out a little bit. Oddly enough, Baltimore here, eight and 12 against the Red Sox and the Yankees. So it's been everybody else that they've really had a lot of problems with. 497 FIP, that's the worst for starting pitchers in all of baseball. They've got the second highest OPS allowed with that third time through the order penalty. And when they allow three runs, they're only five and seven in those games. You have to win games when you allow three or fewer runs. But for Baltimore here, they're not as bad as their numbers would suggest. They've actually underachieved by a good amount offensively here scoring 3.84 runs per game when base runs has them down for 4.13. I'm not saying that they're a good team by any means. I'm simply saying that they're not as bad as they've been so far this season. Now, a team that is very good is the Los Angeles Dodgers. And the Dodgers at 33 and 23 are still one of the biggest underachievers in Major League Baseball this season. They are minus four in base runs. Base runs says they should be 37 and 19, minus three in Pythagorean win-loss, and minus 5.1 in third-order win percentage. So what's the deal here with the Dodgers? Why aren't they living up to their expectations? Well, let's start with this. They have a 7-13 and record in one-run games. They've lost 23 games this season, 13 of their 23 losses have been by one run. They've been walked off on four times. They don't have a walk-off win of their own. Their bullpen left on base percentage is 65.8% this season. That is the second lowest in baseballs. Only Cincinnati has a lower left on base percentage out of the bullpen than the Dodgers. And interestingly enough, when you look at Cincinnati, they're kind of an underachieving team as well in some respects. But the Dodgers here, like I said, 7-13 7-13 and 13 in one-run games. 13 of their 23 losses by one run. And a lot of that has to do with that bullpen left on base percentage of 65.8%. They've got the most plate appearances with a man in scoring position. They're fourth in Woba in that split. They've won 13 times by five or more runs. They're just not having much luck, not having much success in close games, in one-run games, and specifically when the bullpen needs to either keep a game close or protect the lead. So if the Dodgers get this bullpen thing figured out, and I have every bit of confidence that they will, this is a team that should get a lot better as we go forward here. They should already be the best team in baseball by all of these alternate standings metrics. And I think ultimately they do get there, but those are the reasons why they have kind of struggled a little bit. Seven and 13 in one run games, 13 of 23 losses by a run, and then their bullpen left on base percentage, 65.8%. The Dodgers are a play on team. The market is betting on them. And you will see line moves based on these standings metrics differences, specifically base runs and third order win percentage. So the fact that the Dodgers are minus five wins from where they should be in third order win percentage is a big reason why the market keeps betting on the Dodgers basically day in and day out. Lastly here for the clear-cut underachievers, and I'll mention three more in passing as we move on throughout the show, the Minnesota Twins. The Twins here, they are a 22-33 and team with a minus 27 run differential. Pythagorean win-loss says they should be 25-30. and Base run says they should be 26-29. and So the Twins should be four games better by base runs, three games better by Pythagorean win-loss, but only 2.2 games better by third-order win percentage. So here's the thing about the Twins. Their pitching staff is bad. I mean, even by base runs, even if you take all the context and the sequencing out of the equation, base runs still has this team down for allowing more than five runs per game. And this is a team that, look, Maybe they're just not that good. You know, they're they're three and thirteen in games where they've scored exactly three runs. They're only fifteen and eleven with a lead after four innings. You know, they're just 
They're setting up innings for teams. They've made 326 Woba against with the bases empty. So they are constantly facing teams with men on base. They're eighth in number of plate appearances offensively with men in scoring position, but they are 19th in weighted on base average. So they're getting chances, not cashing them in. Opponents are getting chances and they are cashing them in. And furthermore, by FIP, this is the fourth worst bullpen in baseball. So the Twins just might not be a good team this year. There are still indicators that suggest that they will get better, but I don't know if that's going to happen here because their pitching staff is so bad, is having so many issues. So the Twins, a lot of concerns with them, giving up way too many runs, not cashing in on enough chances. Maybe they're an over team as the summer goes along, uh, but I don't know if they will kind of reach some of their alternate standings metrics and what those things currently show. Three other teams here that are at least minus three or higher in third order win percentage are the Marlins, the Diamondbacks, and the Nationals. Marlins, they don't score. They do a good job preventing teams from scoring, but they don't score. So that's their problem. Diamondbacks have battled all kinds of injuries. They're not good in one-run games. In fact, I think they're 2-12, and I want to say, uh, in one-run games here. They've been very bad in that situation. So that's why they're up there. And then the Nationals, you know, the Nationals are a pretty good offensive team for the most part. The pitching staff, not particularly good. That may be one to follow as we go forward here, where the Nationals, maybe just a little bit better than I expected coming into this season. They are minus three in base runs record as well, where they haven't had a lot of success with men in scoring position. So the overachiever list, once again, Red Sox, Cubs, Indians, A's, Mariners, Cardinals, the underachiever list, Orioles, Dodgers, Twins, Marlins, Diamondbacks, and Nationals. And you can look for and will see line moves on those teams here over the next little while as things kind of stabilize a little bit. But once again, email me, skatingtripods at gmail.com to get on the list for the betters box notes. As far as the down the line segment here can kind of reinforce some of the things I just talked about, but also seeing lots of home road split line movements out there. Fades of the Reds and the Cardinals and the Blue Jays on the road. Stuff like that. Fades on individual pitchers based on their home road splits and everything that's going on. A lot of that stuff creating a lot of movement in the marketplace. Home road splits and then these teams that have overachieved or underachieved based on their alternate standings metrics. So be on the lookout for those kinds of things. For example, Sonny Gray and the Reds took money on Tuesday at home against the Phillies and Aaron Nola. The Phillies won that game 17 to three, but we're seeing Reds money at home. Reds fades on the road, pretty much happening across the board in every game that Cincinnati plays. Saw a fade of Ryan Weathers on Tuesday for the Padres, taking on Kyle Hendricks and the Cubs. Expect Ryan Weathers fades as we go forward. Weathers faces the Cubs again next Monday. Uh, Adbert Alzale is supposed to be on the mound for that one. But Weathers has all the usual indicators. Left on base percentage is too high. BABIP is too low. Woba minus X Woba discrepancy is pretty big. Money will come in against Weathers in his next start once again. So be ready for that. Speaking of guys, the market is fading quite consistently. John Gant of the Cardinals. Money came in on the Dodgers. Quite a bit of it with David Price and a bullpen game for the Dodgers. Gant avoided regression yet again. So in his next start, yet again, coming up this weekend against the Cincinnati Reds, expect money to come in against John Gant. If it doesn't, because the Reds are on the road, then that says a lot about where the market is on that game. So look for money against John Gant in every one of his starts. And if you don't see it, well, that's pretty telling in and of itself. Very heavy Astros money on Tuesday. This was Luis Garcia in this one, I believe, against Garrett Richards. Uh, but very heavy Astros. We've seen some significant line movement in Astros games here of late where they've just gotten bet into a very large favorite. Somebody out there with significant amounts of influence liking the Astros in some of these games. That was one of them there on Tuesday. Chris Bassett took money once again for the A's. It was against the Mariners on Tuesday. Really the second straight start. I've noticed it to an extreme degree for Bassett, but Looks like the modeling crowd believes he is very underrated and undervalued for this season. So look for that. Look for line moves when Chris Bassett takes them out. Also on Tuesday here, 
flipped favorite. And we actually saw a flipped favorite in both games, Tuesday and Wednesday, in favor of the Texas Rangers taking on the Colorado Rockies. Now, the Rockies don't have Trevor Story. He's a big part of their offense. So that's really the reason why I think these lines have moved and have moved significantly. But, man, I don't like the Rangers at all. The Rangers are not playing well. They were terrible up in Seattle. They have not played well in this series here against Colorado. I don't think the Rangers are a good team at all. The market seems to think higher of them than I do. Uh, But I've been fading them quite a bit lately. And, in fact, I faded them here today on Thursday as well. Wednesday, Cubs money yet again. Alzali and Lamett in that one. Cubs taking money in that game. Uh, probably more of a fate of Lamont and the Padres bullpen than anything else. That Padres bullpen has been worked to the bone here of late. Uh, maybe the market likes the Cubs quite a bit. I'm not on that train, uh, but the Cubs did take money in that one. Madison Bumgarner and the Diamondbacks took money on Wednesday against David Peterson and the Mets. Peterson gets run from the game in the first inning. Bumgarner sucks again. He's going for an MRI on his shoulder. The Diamondbacks took money and lost, and that's been a very familiar theme here with them, uh, and a familiar theme with me as well, because I took Arizona in that one, uh, and they were a loser for me in that game. Orioles took money yesterday against the Twins, and Randy Dobnak, I disagreed with this line move, played this one early on Minnesota, paid for it dearly. They didn't hit Matt Harvey, who was pitching on three days rest. Uh, Dobnak is not a guy that the market likes right now, so a little premature from me with that one. Again, though, like I talked about with the Twins, they show all the signs of being better, and they're just not. So if money comes in against them, it's some pretty strong money and probably some money that you should respect. Jordan Montgomery and the Yankees took a lot of money on Wednesday against Shane McClanahan and the Rays. Yankees took quite a bit of money in that Rays series, actually, uh, except for the game that Tyler Glass now pitched. I I don't know. You know, I mean, the, the Yankees are one of these teams that should be better than they are. You know, you get their contact metrics and all that stuff. They should be better than they are. They just haven't taken that next step yet for whatever reason. Uh, and I don't know if I want to fade the Rays right now with how well they've been playing. So an interesting line move there. Not one I agreed with or disagreed with, but it was pretty telling to say the least. Like I talked about, Seattle is a team that we should be looking to fade right now. They are overachieving quite a bit. And we did see Sean Manaya and Oakland money on Wednesday against the Mariners there and the A's did win that game. So a lot of money will be coming in against Seattle over the next little while. And in fact, we're seeing angels money here today with Griffin canning on the mound against the Mariners. The Jays took money at home in this series up in Buffalo. That was Pablo Lopez and Alec Manoa on Wednesday. Neither starter pitched that girl. Well, Lopez pitched pretty well, but strikeouts ran up his pitch count. The, Mar- the Marlins bullpen, excuse me, not able to hold off the Jays. Seeing some road fades of the Marlins. I agree with this. Marlins Park is a great pitcher's park. So that's a big reason why we're seeing money come in against Miami on the road where their pathetic offense is having a really hard time trying to keep up. Lastly, for Wednesday, as I mentioned, uh, Jordan Lyles flipped into a favorite against Senzatella and the Rockies. Rockies win that one 6-3. Rangers not scoring in this series so far. Rangers not scoring a whole lot lately at all. Uh, We'll see what happens in this Thursday game where this time Colorado's taking the money with Mike fulton on the mound against Austin Gomber. The Braves took some early money. That was Patrick Corbin against Tucker Davidson. Um, Not really a whole lot of thoughts on that one. Just, you know, continuing what we've seen where the Braves just take money pretty much day in and day out. Seeing on display very much the Reds and the Cardinals and the home home road splits for these two teams here. Vladimir Gutierrez getting the start for the Reds, Adam Wainwright for the Cardinals. This one jumped about 40 cents based on the overnights with a lot of Cardinals money, a lot of money on Wainwright there in that one against the Reds. We'll see what we see as the rest of this series goes along, and I'll talk more about this series as we go forward, but it's been a pretty standard issue blanket fade of the Reds when they're on the road, and that is happening here today. Twins are taking money today. Jay Happ and Chris Bubik, maybe a play on the Twins, maybe a fade of Bubik, could be a little bit of both. Uh, I am not on this game. I'm not betting the Twins until they figure their shit out, but this is a line move that we are seeing here for Thursday. Pick for tonight's action. Well, I'm fading the Cubs tonight, backing the Giants and Anthony DiSclefani, but also the Seattle and Los Angeles over. Griffin Canning, a fly ball guy with command issues, 
The Mariners, a fly ball offense, as we've talked about. They're 14th in slugging percentage on the road. So, you know, on the road, away from pitcher-friendly T-Mobile Park, they've been a decent offensive team. So Seattle and Anaheim, Los Angeles Angels, whatever the hell they're called now, over nine in that game. And then also that Giants play for tonight. And speaking of the Cubs and Giants series, let's dig in a little bit more with that one. Zach Davies, Anthony DiScofani tonight. Already gave you my thoughts on that one. Jake Arietta, Logan Webb tomorrow. If the price is reasonable, I'll be on the Giants tomorrow. Cole Stewart, Kevin Gaussman Saturday. Kyle Hendricks, Johnny Cueto on Sunday. Big favorite role for the Giants here on Saturday. I think the Giants take money here on Friday to be sure. Sunday, I don't know, but I'm pretty positive the Giants taking money Thursday, Friday, and Saturday here in this series. And as I said, I feel like the Cubs have taken advantage of the quirks of Wrigley Field. Now they're out on the road. Team's not really used to traveling across multiple time zones and all of that. I think the Giants are set up well in this series. I think taking a Giants series price, not a bad idea. I haven't seen that one yet. Uh, But like I talked about with Boston and Houston, you can find some opportunities with those series prices. Houston winning that series at minus 120. I would expect the Giants to win this series here as well. Astros and Blue Jays, Zach Granke, Hunjin Ryu, Jose Urquidy, Ross Stripling, and then Luis Garcia and Steven Matz here for this weekend. The Astros are playing like the team that we expected them to be now. The Jays still swinging it very well at home. And again, going to be very interesting for these teams that go to Buffalo for the first time. Houston going up there to play in this park. They've never played in this park. Should play well for their offense. Should play well for Toronto's offense as well. But one of the biggest things for Toronto in this series, they have the better bullpen. So if these games are close... I would trust their relief court more than what we've got for Houston. So that may be a live betting angle or something like that, but it is something to keep in mind here for this series. The problem is Stripling and Matt's both pitching very poorly right now. So we'll probably see Astros money on Saturday and Sunday here, I would think. Uh, but you know, we'll see what those prices look like and also what those line moves wind up being. The Reds Cardinals series, as I said, Gutierrez and Wainwright tonight. Luis Castillo and Quang Hung Kim on Friday. Tyler Mayle and to be determined on Saturday. That would have been Jack Flaherty's spot, but he's now out. And then Wade Miley and John Gant on Sunday. So let's see what we get on Sunday. That's really the game I'm looking forward to in this series. Does the market fade John Gant? Does the market bet on Wade Miley, a guy that the market typically doesn't like? Will the market be willing to bet on the Reds on the road in a really good pitcher's park like Bush Stadium. It's tough. I think the Reds have the upper hand with the pitching matchups to some degree in this series, but I don't know if people want to bet on them in this series. So it'll be fascinating to watch the lines and the movement there with the Reds and the Cardinals. Dodgers and the Braves, three awesome games in this series. Julio Urias, Ian Anderson Friday, Clayton Kershaw, Charlie Morton Saturday, Trevor Bauer, Max Freed on Sunday. Awesome pitching matchups in this series. But this is a good offensive environment. So I'm really curious to see how these games are totaled and how these two offenses wind up performing. Braves are a top five offense at home. Dodgers are a top five offense in baseball. Uh, the Atlanta pitching staff is you know, still kind of in a state of flux. We'll see what happens with their bullpen. Lots of stuff going on in this series. I don't know if there's a whole lot to bet. But what I am curious to see is whether or not the Braves ever start performing up to their capabilities, because this team should be a hell of a lot better than it actually is. And also too, something else here to kind of consider is that we've seen that the Dodgers have taken money. You know, I just talked about how the Dodgers have underachieved based on the alternate standings metrics. Well, we've also seen a lot of Braves money too. So which side does the market prefer? And more importantly, the influential parts of the market that get in on these games early, which side do they prefer in these games? I think it should be a lot of fun to see what happens in that series. Lastly here, of course, as always, Red Sox and Yankees, Nate Uvalde and to be determined on Friday, Eduardo Rodriguez, Jamison tie on Saturday, Garrett Richards and Domingo Herman will get together on Sunday night baseball on ESPN. The Yankees are off. There's only three games on Monday, which is very nice. But when you look at this, uh, the Red Sox here, 
they host the Marlins right away on Monday at 5-10. So that's an interesting little spot for both of these teams here, I think. The Red Sox and the Yankees. So Yankees finally getting a day off. Will they finally live up to their offensive potential here in this series? And the Red Sox, quick turnaround for Monday, quick turnaround after today as well to take on the Yankees. Interesting, to say the least here. I'll be curious to see what happens with the line moves, especially because, as I said, I do think Boston kind of a fade team against better teams. Now, I am on Boston today, but over the long haul, you do kind of wonder about them as they step up in class a little bit. Skating tripods at gmail.com for the notes for the betters box. Make sure you sign up for those because there is a lot to follow on every one of these editions of this show. I'll be back again on Monday after the weekend with another edition of the betters box. That'll do it for me. Thank you so much for listening, everybody. And remember that you will never strike out when you're in the betters box.